Well, in August of 1946, Congress passed an act authorizing the coining of uh, 100,000 silver half dollars and permitted the state to sell those uh, coins at a profit. The uh, banks of the states undertook the job of selling them, and they were sold at a profit of $198,000. Uh, this sale uh, took place uh, during my administration as governor, and uh, the proceeds of the sale were supposed to be used for the observation of the uh, centennial. However, the half dollars didn't arrive in Iowa until December of 46, and the sale wasn't completed until the winter of 1947, and so we had to find out how we were going to use the funds, and so it was decided to set them up in the form of a perpetual charitable trust, which is known as the Iowa Centennial Memorial Foundation. Well, tomorrow, uh, the first Iowa award by that foundation will be given to former President Herbert Hoover. The foundation has been in operation several years and has granted quite a number of scholarships to young men and young women going to Iowa colleges. And that, uh, briefly, is the history of the Iowa Centennial Memorial Foundation. For me to tell you that this is the hottest day, I wouldn't say that it was because I've been here ever since I was uh, barefooted with blue shirts and overhauls on. <laughs> Well, for an old farmer like I am, uh, this is uh, good corn weather, so uh, we're not complaining too much about it. We think it's a good thing for the, for the crops. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. It's always one of the highlights of the year to attend the Iowa State Fair. Four vacancies, which occur from separation and death, resignation, and so on. Now, there's a turnover each year in most all the agencies, averaging about 36%. Uh, my amendment, uh, if it was uh, adopted uh, to all the appropriation bills, it would save over a billion dollars. However, there's some departments that we must exempt, such as law enforcement agency, the Atomic Energy Commission, which I did uh, exempt in my original amendment, and uh, doctors and, uh, and nurses in veterans' hospitals, and, uh, the, and such things as that. Now, uh, my amendment has been adopted to six appropriation bills. We'd give them a major professor in the field in which they were particularly interested in becoming specialized. We'd expect them to go to our seminars and take part in discussion groups. We certainly would show them any, any research we had in progress in which they were interested. We'd keep nothing from them at all. Uh, we think that students get a lot more out of it if it's done that way. Have there any, uh, been any recent examples of uh, students from the behind the Iron Curtain here on campus or on campuses here in the states that you know about? Well, I don't uh, remember any from strictly behind the Iron Curtain right recently. We had uh, some Yugoslavian students here about two years ago. Uh, while I was at the University of Wisconsin, we had uh, several Polish students, but I don't believe we've had anyone from behind the Iron Curtain here at Iowa State within the past two years. About how many students do you have here from other countries? Well, on the entire campus, that is, uh, including all the other divisions, not strictly agriculture, I'm sure at the present time we have more than 200. More than 200. Yes. Uh, is that uh, a year-by-year -year practice? Yes. We, uh, Iowa State College has always been popular in uh, a good many foreign countries, and we always seem to get numerous graduate students from various foreign countries. We find the situation prevalent all over the country of increasing exemptions from property taxation. Uh, 
and this amount, which is exempt, tends to constantly increase. You've done previous studies on this. Yes, sir. The last study of this character was made in 1845 and 1846. And due to two factors, uh, one being the fact that we have constantly added to the amount of exempt property, and the other being the fact that valuations have increased when measured by dollar. The amount of uh, exempt property at this time is more than twice what it was 10 years ago. Well, these studies in 1945 and 1946, uh, you say that the five billion is almost twice it is more than twice. The more than twice. It uh, was indicated there. Do you have examples of specific other studies in other states? Very few have been made. The state of Colorado made a survey of this kind some years ago. That is the only complete study that I know of that has been made by other states. You recall that the total letting was 3,300,000. Uh, upon this map, I've shown um, the primary projects only. It, the question is being asked, where does the Highway Commission spend their money? We don't see it. The reason the average Ironman don't see it is because it is spread over necessary projects in all, all locations. For an example, we have a very important road leading into Council Bluffs, namely number 100. This letting covers the grading and the bridging of that uh, project. It is off the beaten path at the present time. It is, the cost for now is four million, uh, four, beg your pardon, uh, 443,000. We will eventually pay from Council Bluffs east over to Griswold. Until such time as all that world is completed, the people of Iowa will not see where their money is going. But it will become a very vital uh, part of our system. Now we have other projects that you can see. Our writing service through the city of Nevada is not entirely satisfactory. Uh, if we took and completely rebuilt that paving there, it would cost practically $200,000. The commission engineers have investigated the present paving, decided that the base is adequate. The commission decided wisely to resurface it at $43,000, $45,000. You will find that's a very satisfactory street next uh, summer. This road here, number 14, is our last gap of paving for number 14 through Iowa, which the people have demanded for years. We are happy to say that we finally got the last gap on 14 under grading contract, and I anticipate that we can carry on with a paving project on that next year.
Our wage proposal has been to the limit permissible under the Wage Stabilization Board regulations. We have offered a guaranteed vacation equal to one just recently negotiated in the industry by one of the leading maritime unions. We have offered to sit down in joint subcommittee to eliminate the so-called inequities existing between the National Maritime Union contract and the other principal union in the industry on the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts. All of these proposals have been flatly rejected by the maritime unions. The committee is at a loss to know where to turn in this situation. When the ship owners say that the seamen are making fabulous demands, they're not telling the truth. The seamen have asked only that they be given the same consideration as other workers. They're asking for the 40-hour week. And when they work over 40 hours, they want to be paid for it. If they don't work, they won't be paid for it. The ship operators say that the seamen make fabulous wages. They don't tell the public, however, that a seaman is working in a seasonal occupation and very seldom gets more than six months' work a year. I saw and heard the greatest explosion that man has ever created in the history of the world. I had a feeling that I was standing at the gates of hell looking into eternity. But at the same time, you know and are apprehensive of the fact that you are about to witness a bomb which was many, many times greater than Hiroshima. You are about to witness an explosion that man had never attempted before the history of civilization or the history of the world, and you're scared. When the blast did occur, of course our eyes were covered, but out of the blackness of the night, this huge fireball just illuminated the entire sea. The huge tower from which the bomb had been detonated had completely vaporized in the air. There was nothing there. And I looked down on that spot where this bomb had been exploded and saw the utter desolation and the ruin. And everything seemed so hopeless. I couldn't at that time help but recall what a famous World War general had said to me that morning as we had left Enewetok in our crash boat and were leaning over the side looking into the waters of the lagoon. He'd remarked to me, I wonder if we are in plane with things which 
belong to God alone. I didn't say anything to him, but I just looked up and shook my head. And I wondered to myself, almost audibly asking God, were we playing with things which belonged to him alone? Had I just seen a preview of the destruction of civilization, I wondered, had I seen the end of the world? military training and service legislation, I think is a matter of great historic significance. It's the result of 30 years of effort which brought to a successful conclusion this morning. And it means that we now have, for the first time, the basis for a continuing system of uh, military defense with which to face the difficulties of the future, and with which to support our position internationally in the world, and which we can do without crippling ourselves financially. I'm very happy to uh, witness the signing of the bill this morning, and I am uh, also very much pleased that uh, I can be associated here at this moment with those who played a leading part in securing its passage through Congress. I not only think they would have a winning candidate, I am absolutely positive the Republican Party would have a winning candidate with Eisenhower in 52. Unquestionably, he's one of the best liked men in the whole world. And that includes people of every political type of thinking there is in the United States. And for that reason, I feel confident of the answer that I've given you. Well, I think everybody would agree that there's no job in the world today as important as the presidency of the United States. And therefore, no job is big enough to keep a man out of the presidency if he's qualified for the presidency, which I feel the General Eisenhower is. In the past two months, it has become apparent that after defense needs are met, the manufacturers of consumers' goods, such as automobiles, household appliances, and the like, will have great difficulty in securing their fair share of the reduced supply of steel, copper, and aluminum available. For this reason, the National Production Authority is extending the operation of the Controlled Materials Plan to assure a share of materials to the manufacturer of such civilian items. This change affects only civilian producers, but our first concern must continue to be to keep the military production program on schedule. Whatever the outcome of ceasefire talks in Korea, there cannot be a ceasefire in the furnaces of American industry which produce for defense. Uh, Randy, tell me, do you think uh, Sugar Ray Robinson was the toughest opponent you ever had? Well, as to date, yes, he is. He is. And do you intend to change your style of boxing to fight him this time? Well, I'll have to wait and see when I get in the ring about that. I see. Now, uh, people were saying that Sugar Ray was not in condition at the time of his fight. What do you think about that? 
Well, if I'd have been fighting as regular as what he had, I should have expected myself to be in this pinker condition. Yes, I can understand. Now, what did you train on? Did you train on an austerity diet here? <coughs> no, no, I don't diet or anything. I just eat natural. The roast beef of old England? Yes. That's the boy. Thank you very much, Randy. Sure. Thank you, okay, sir. Okay. Come on, now.